Well, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, this is joint work with uh, Aaron Garrett. He's from uh, Warfield College. Uh, and he wrote the a library called Inspired, and no, there isn't a typo there, that's the, how it's spelled, with a Y. Um, and for people who don't grasp what co uh, evolutionary computation is, some people know it as genetic algorithms, but actually evolutionary computation is a bit, uh, expanding the genetic algorithms a bit more. Um, for people who don't know what it is, then uh, it's a set of algorithms or techniques to solve problems that are typically hard to solve, that have a large solution space, uh, generally optimization problems, uh, and the way to solve them are just like nature evolved and created us or other species to adapt to environment, while the solutions adapt to whatever we ask them to adapt to, uh, to some objectives to set for them. So it's usually good for NP hard problems, such as the traveling salesman, maybe people know about it, uh, it's also good for techniques, that, for problems that are how to solve using existing techniques or just how to formulate. You can't really understand how to write the code for this. It's sometimes easier using evolutionary computation techniques. And again, problem of many solutions that just, you need something good enough. You don't need the best, but give it to me. And evolutionary computation will give it to you. So um, this is Aaron Garrett. Uh, he wrote Inspired. Uh, I've been working for him several years over email, computer, all the time. Um, uh, Inspired has several other examples, including swarm intelligence, neural networks, uh, genetic algorithms, which are a subset of evolution and computation. It also includes uh, simulating annealing. You can say that those are all kind of random optimization techniques in that library. Um, but you don't necessarily have to make them random. You can, uh, you can do some other things with them. So in this talk, I'm going to give you examples. And I'm going to show you two examples of what evolutionary computation is good at. And the first examples co example comes from my world. Uh, I develop disease models, and I need to deal with data. And data sometimes that I don't have, uh, don't have uh, access to, individual data and medical data. No one can pass around this data. However, they publish summary data all the time. Clinical trials, you can look it up, you can use it, and the summary data is available. So I need to run simulations sometimes on populations that I don't see the individual data, but I do see the summary data. So what do I do? I generate individuals that match the statistics. I need to generate multiple individuals, not one. They all have different characteristics. Each clinical trial is different, uh, and uh, characteristics such as uh, male, female, uh, what's the age of the people participating, what's the blood pressure. Sometimes they are correlated, like blood pressure and age do have some connection between those. Uh, and sometimes, when I generate records, sometimes the I want to delete some records. Let's say uh, people below a certain age, I don't want them in my data set. Let's say below of age 18, then I don't want this last record. So after I generated all of the statistics, that I do want to still the mimic, uh, mimic the, statistic of the, uh, the statistics of the clinical trial or whatever population I'm generating. It doesn't have to be a clinical trial. It can be a population of cell phones or a population of uh, people in the country or whatever it is. So let's start without evolutionary computation. Let me show you some of the problems when you start uh, working without uh, evolutionary computation techniques. Um, I have here a simple problem. I want to generate uh, a population of 10 people, small, just so I can show you. And I want them to be uh, ever, uh, some of them male, some of them female, 50% in uh, both. And I want uh, the age of male to be distributed with an average of 53 and standard deviation of 10. And I want the female to be distributed 52 with standard deviation of 7. This is what I want. This is what. It, uh, within the micro-simulation tool, this is the tool that I write, and you can find it in uh, my GitHub account, I can write those equations, and it will generate me a population. The population of 10 people 
with the example I showed, will generate a small table, zeros and ones for male, uh, to define who, who, who's male and who's female, and the ages are distributed. However, if I look at the statistics of what I collected, I'll find out, oh, wait, I got a mean age of 57. Whoa, whoa, I started with 52, 53. How did I get a 57? Well, there are two things, two phenomena happening here. One of them is, this is generated using Monte Carlo techniques. I run random numbers and I get random uh, synthetic people. They, they don't exist really. So if I use a random process, there is some randomness and there will be standard deviation of the uh, process itself. And therefore, the process will not always give me what I want. There's some, uh, there's some normal distribution typically around it. However, there's one more thing that happened here. I also added an inclusion criteria. I asked that the age will be between age 45 and 90. So whenever the system generated a person who's below age 45, well, it dropped it out of the table. If I drop things like this out of the table, only the low ages, what do I get left with? The higher ages, and therefore the distribution gets skewed. This happens a lot in clinical trials, because if you look at them, they have like inclusion and exclusion criteria, and sometimes like very, very long, uh, uh, a very long set of inclusion and exclusion criteria. It depends on what clinical trial they're on. So therefore, the distribution of relations that they publish eventually are skewed somehow, and you don't really have information about them. So, but you still want to somehow imitate them. Before I go on and show you the solution, I'm going to show you how it was, uh, how we run this without. This is the micro simulation tool. This is only, micro simulation tool can do a lot of things. One of them is only population generation. And here is how I entered the equations. And if I run the simulation, it will take a few seconds and it will generate, actually, split second in this case, uh, and it will generate some results, and you can see the results, and look just at the number of men. It generated 70% men, I asked for 50% male. See all those ones? If I run it again, it will give me something a little bit different. So this is the first type of error I was talking about. The second one, it has to do with uh, how you define and all those, uh, how do you define the problem and all those inclusion exclusion criteria. Let's add evolutionary computation to the problem. This will help us solve it. So I had before a set of generation rules and I had the micro simulation tool, MIST for short. And I ran those expression generators. It created the Python program that created a bunch of individuals. Now, let's add one more set of things, let's say, obje let's add objectives. Objective is actually how you want the statistics of the population to look at the end. Not the population where you sampled from, this can be anything, but what the statistics you want, what statistics you want to reach at the end. Once I have the, defined those objectives, I have inspired. Inspired runs evolutionary computation algorithms on it and selects only a subset of my set of candidates that I generated. So let's say I generated a thousand individuals, I'll select only 10. And those 10 will be the best 10 that will match the statistics that I wanted. Now, if you run in your head, if you the number of combinations, so 10 out of the thousand, you find out it's combinatorial. So it's a huge uh, solution space. Let me go into further details of what, what will happen, then I'm going to show it to you. So I have this bunch of candidates, and from those I generate solutions. I select subsets of those candidates, and each one of those is a solution. Whether good or bad, I don't know, but it's a solution, and typically it's chosen randomly at first. I evaluate each one of those solutions. I give it a score, how good it fits my objectives. So low score here is better. So I'll select the best solutions from the last uh, uh, population of, uh, of solutions. In, here, in this case, the populations, the, the solutions themselves are populations, but I'm talking about the larger, it's larger populations of solutions. I select the best ones. Then I start changing those. 
So the best ones, I treat them as parents and I create offspring by matching them, taking part of the one, one parent and part of the other. Another variation I can add is I can take a solution and just mutate it. I change one, one individual there with another individual. <clears throat> so now look at this. I have another set of solutions, uh, a population of solutions. I repeat this process multiple times, just like in nature, many generations of people or species uh, evolved throughout time for many, many generations. Eventually, after many generations of solutions, I get to some level of stability, uh, hopefully, and the best solution there is usually the solution I'm seeking. So there's quite a bit of computing power thrown in it, but eventually it usually does converge pretty well. Um, let's look at the example, but now let's add objectives. I'm using the same uh, distribution of people as before. Um, you have uh, age distributed the same way and 50% made. So this is where I sample my candidates from. Now I have a population, let's say a population uh, of people of clinical trial. Now I'm saying, yeah, but that clinical trial specifically, I want the age to be mean of 50 and standard deviation of 5. And notice this is below the distribution I actually sampled and very close to the cutoff point uh, as before. Uh, I'm 45. So this is a hard task. I'm asking it to give me something that would be a certain very specific age and standard deviation. And also, I want to skew the population a bit more. I want 60% male instead of 50% male. So these are harder constraints. When I implement objectives, I usually also give them a weight to say, in case of a conflict, which one of them is more important. And uh, after doing so, you run the simulation and you get a bunch of individuals and the numbers usually much, match much better than uh, before. It has to do with how much computing power we flow with it. If you want to be more accurate, you'll have to add more computing power. But now, the numbers will match better. The evolutionary computation will figure out a way how to do this for us. So, let me show you the same example, only now with the objectives. I added objectives here, and they have different weights. The weights also help you uh, sometimes scale things that are different scales, different unit, uh, things have different scales in different units. And if I run the simulation, it will generate a solution. And if I look at the solution, the numbers don't say much, but let's look at the statistics. It actually told me, um, I, I told it I want uh, age average of 50, it got to 49.99 something, and sun deviation of 5, it got to 4.9, and it did hit the 60% uh, male exactly. Um, let me show you what happened behind the scenes. So, this is when you ran Inspired, started running the Inspired library, after generating the, the people, what it did, it uh, ran a creative population of solutions, and this is the, the statistics of each generation. So the first generation, well, it was not very good. Uh, the numbers here should be as low as possible. But little by little, you see it converges and the numbers become lower and lower and lower, and after several generations, it de decides, yeah, it's good enough, and we hit the statistics that you want. So, let's go and tell you a little bit more about how Inspired does this. Inspired has a solver for evolutionary computation. That solver will plug in our problem. How do we do this? We define all sorts of small operators that help inspired, uh, inspired uh, figure out our problem. The first one, the maybe most important one, is the evaluator. The evaluator, uh, you plug it into inspired and it's a function you write yourself that tell you how close your solution is to your objective, whatever your objective is in your, uh, in your problem. 
the next thing it does, uh, and, and next maybe most important thing is the generator. The generator generates solutions out of thin air because typically use, use ram random numbers to generate solutions. They don't have to be good. Just give me a solution that ma matches what, the, what you have. In my case here, the, further, the generator was uh, generate, uh, select from a thousand people only 10 people that match my population. This was my generator. So I had this thousand candidates and I selected 10 of them, each time different 10. Uh, var variators is where you actually define, if you have two solutions in case of two parents, how do you create the offspring? Usually you match, you take half from one parent and half from the other. Not always, it, it depends on exactly what your problem looks like. And we'll show you another problem in a second. Um, mutations where you have a solution and you variate it uh, by damaging it a little bit. Uh, some plants in nature produce this way and evolve just because some the mutations that were added because of environment actually mutate them a little bit. So um, variators, you can define multiple of those in Inspired and Inspired will use them all or whatever you use, want to use. There's also other operators such as Selector that tells you how to select the best solutions. You sometimes don't want always only the best. Sometimes you want the best and something else, or maybe you want this, um, uh, some sort of natural selection process. You define it in the selection function where you actually say, here, is, here are all my uh, solutions, select some of them according to whatever criteria you want to select. Uh, a terminator will tell Inspired where to stop. Do I want to continue until convergence? And what do I define convergence? The same generations, a certain number of time, the same population, a certain number of generations, or maybe something else in mind. Maybe I just need something close enough, and when I get there, I stop. So this is what you define in Terminator. There are some other um, elements in other uh, objects that I'm not uh, describing here now. You'll find it uh, with examples in Inspired documentation. It has some very nice documentation on Python hosted. Um, highly recommended just to look at the example. They're, they're inspiring on their own. I'm going to show you another example of a problem. Uh, this time, the problem is totally different. I have, uh, I'm trying to create a board game tournament and uh, I want people to, and at the end of the tournament, I want to find out what the best play, who was the best player. To do this, I need all the players to play a certain number of games and switch between games and teams that they play with. This is the only way to figure out who's really good in different environments. So to design such a tournament, uh, I need some, uh, I need some uh, definition. So the first one, I'll have M teams, and each one of them will be of different sizes or the same size, N1 until Nm. Also, I have some constraints for this good solution. I have to define what the good tournament is. So a good tournament is the, where each player plays with each other player, because I want to see the interaction between all strategies that the players can figure out. Also, I want each player to play the same number of games with each player. Now it's a harder uh, uh, restriction. I'll add another restriction. Since this tournament doesn't, cannot go forever, I want to do this within a certain number of games, and I want the system to find me the optimal solution. I added some constraints, and let me show you a simple solution. Um, the simplest solution is two players, two games. This is the solution. Each player plays with each other player once. You can see that player A played with B once, then with D, then with C. The tournament itself is defined by the swaps between the teams. Uh, so for example, between the first game uh, and the second game, you have uh, B swapped with uh, D. This is the, uh, the swap that happened. And then, this is how you define a solution, a certain number of swaps between games. However, this is easy to do on pen and paper. Try to do this with three teams of four, or five teams of three, or one team with two and one a team, and a team with three and a team with a four, all sorts of combinations like this. You'll find out that 
you'll go, go nuts with the pen and paper after a little while. The, the solution space is combinatorial here. So um, we still want to be able to design such a tournament and also within all those funny constraints that I added. So I wrote a small little program for that. Uh, you'll find it in my GitHub account. It's called Fair Tournament. And this is just to demo. So I'm going to first show you that it actually does work. So here's one example I made in earlier. And I'm adding all sorts of small uh, little elements here, such as the random seed. Because it's a demo, I don't want things to go haywire. And just to let you see what happened, it did find a solution within three numbers. And if you go up, you can see it started evolving. And you can see it sometimes stays several generations in the same solution. But then every once in a while, it just jumps and uh, improves the solution. Here, here's the jump in generation 19. And then at the end, it will later jump once more. So there are two jumps. And each time I record, which player plays with each other, how many plays each player plays with each other player in a matrix like this, which tells me each row is a player, each column is a player, who played with who. And you can see the diagonal is always one because the same player is always in the same team with himself. Um, sorry, the, the diagonal is the number of games, sorry. Um, so you can see that after three games, it did find the optimal solution. It did continue running until 15 games because I asked it to. But it said after three games, you have the optimal solution and chose it. And this is the solution and the swaps of players. And by the way, there might be multiple solutions of, that are very similar, or almost mirror-like of, uh, of the solution. Let me show you the code, how it looks like, so you will have some intuition. Here's the code. So I'm going to rush through it. I'm not showing you all the uh, long, uh, long functions. I'm showing you only the basics you know, related to Inspire. So Inspire has a decorator for uh, the, uh, the, its object. So here's an evaluator function. Um, you basically pass to, you, you declare that this is an evaluator that Inspire is using. And you pass it the arguments of your problem. Uh, and later, you'll have to unwrap them from the argument so you can actually figure out what the team sizes and the maximum number of rounds is. And then you can evaluate. It is a long function that will eventually evaluate what happened, uh, evaluate how close your best uh, tournament, uh, uh, guess best uh, swaps to the boss, best swap combination to the best uh, solution here. Here's a crossover example where you have two parents, mom and dad here, and you take those parents and you take 50% of the time you take the swaps from one parent, 50% of the time you take it from the other, and this is random. So this is how you create two other offspring, uh, brother and sister out of this. Uh, a mutator will just, according to some mutation rate that you define, will damage your solution and just sw uh, change some of the swaps that you make. And here's the heart. Uh, when you apply evolutionary computation, there's this evolutionary computation object. And there you start plugging in. Here's my selector. And it has pre, uh, some selections that are, people usually use that uh, are already in inspired. Here's our variator. And notice, I use two variators here, and I just give it the list of variators and inspire it will use them all, or whatever it uh, chooses to cho use. Uh, a replacer. Uh, I didn't talk about replacers, but this is how you, gener how you decide what uh, the next generation will look like. So I have to go back to questions and answers, but you just ask the system to evolve, and it does the trick for you. And while you're answering, uh, I'm answering your questions, you can Google things from my account and go to my GitHub and take up the tournament. I think I'm done. <laughs> Questions? Uh, the question was, is there a way to account for population variety? Uh, I'm not sure about what you mean for variety. If, if, you look at the, if you looked at the examples I gave you where you generate populations, there was a lot of variety there. 
And, and you can, do, during, when you run the simulations in Inspired, you can decide whatever you want to, to happen. I told you there are many steps there. You can select which solutions fit you, and this is one way to affect the population variety. But which population do you actually mean? Okay, the question is whether, uh, uh, yeah, the, the question is whether you, uh, uh, that, uh, in evolutionary computation, usually you want the simulation, uh, the, 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 the solutions to be as different from each other as possible, otherwise you'll converge to the same uh, answer all the time. So, yes, you can do this, but you have to control what, exactly what you want, and Inspire does give you the tools. For example, the replacer tool that I talked about, uh, I actually didn't talk about it, but there are two elements. There's selection, where you select what are the best. So you don't always have to select the best and converge to the, uh, to the best. You sometimes can do what's called natural selection and just have random selection according to some distribution from the solutions. So this is one time, one way you can control the variety. The second way is when you, you, you define the replacer, which the replacer defines your next generation, what will be in your next generation. You can make sure that the replacer, that if you have things that are too close to each other, then yeah, you do something else with them. You do have the tools to handle this. What you do with it, well, you have to know what you're doing. Okay.